Thank you. It was the fall of 1989, and I just graduated from college in the Bay Area, and I found myself heading down to Los Angeles to start a year-long public policy fellowship. Even though I was a stranger to LA, I was brimming with confidence and excitement. I was about to engage in a year-long series of debates about public policy and public affairs. A few weeks into the fellowship, I was joking around with one of my colleagues, a progressive Latina who's known in the area for her college activism. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I knew I said something terribly boorish and was relieved that she knew that I was joking with her and we laughed out loud about it. And then all of a sudden, she got very serious. And she said, you know, Jonathan, that's not politically correct. I froze. My tongue got tied, I, I stumbled. I didn't know what to say. I was trying to back out of this very awkward situation and then looked stunned as she leaned her head back and laughed out loud at my expense. She was having a lot of fun at my expense. Well played. <laughs> at that moment, I found myself at the beginning of a great new friendship and I found myself at the beginning of an education about political correctness. Upon reflection, it's just odd um, that I didn't know what she was talking about. In fact, when I think about um, my own college experiences, my own political orientation, it just seemed strange that I might be missing something terribly obvious. And it turns out I was. You see, I went to Stanford University in the late 1980s. And before anybody gets too impressed by that, in fact, if they would be impressed, I share this image. They said it humanizes me. Um, I don't know exactly what was so special about me in a Mickey Mouse poster, but there it is. In any event, in my freshman year, I found myself at Stanford in the late 1980s. Now, this was Stanford before the 5% advent rate. In fact, I remember in the spring of my freshman year when the Stanford Daily ran a headline about the incoming class of freshmen, and it announced for the first time in Stanford's history the advent rate had fallen below, wait for this, 20%. And while I sat there wondering how in the heck did I get into Stanford, one thing wasn't a mystery. I knew that I was at Stanford during a time when there were roiling debates on campus about the primacy of Western civilization and culture. I was part of a generation of freshmen in particular who were sorted it randomly into three different tracks, all focusing on some sort of approach to studying Western culture and civilization. The most traditional of these tracks was called Great Books. And uh, great books focus on um, um, familiar treatises of the Western canon, these seemingly timeless texts that explored love and friendship, politics, civics, philosophy, religion. And you're familiar with some of these names, I wager. Plato, Socrates, and some guy named St. Augustine who had a few things he had to get off of his chest. <laughs> Now, I was a true guinea pig. I was in the, the randomly sorted into a series called Conflict and Change in Western Culture. This was the radical approach to the study of Western civilization. I remember on my first day of class, the teacher went to the front of the, of the lecture hall and went to the um, podium and offered a broad overview of world religions. And he said that we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss, as part of his lecture, we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss those religions that practiced uh, performative acts of cannibalism. Seems strange, but then he said, think about it, at the very heart of Western civilization is a very commonly accepted practice that in the sacramental wine, you're drinking the blood of Jesus Christ and in the wafer, consuming his body. I was completely hooked. <laughs> I knew that I could calm, at least I would be eating three hours of lecture a week of these upside down ways of viewing the world and then I can call my parents and get them completely stressed out about the education I was receiving <laughs> at Stanford. <laughs> and I actually did this, I'm not joking around, I did this and uh, my parents didn't take the bait. They weren't concerned at all about these crazy ideas. They mainly wanted to know, why are you calling home so often? <laughs> so it goes with my family. In any event, this little glimpse into my freshman 
year is important, not because of my experiences, because it actually, for what it says about what happened when an institution like Stanford took a serious look at the presumptive value of Western civilization. Stanford, the bucolic country club-like campus known as the farm, found itself mocked for the role it played in the culture wars raging across college campuses, and found itself vilified for the role that it was playing contributing to the devaluation of Western civilization and the miseducation of a generation of soft-headed, pampered youth. Sound familiar? <laughs> now, this freshman course that I took was one in a series of dust-ups during my Stanford career that, taken together, asked really important questions about values. The, uh, what had value? Who had value? And what happened when the very idea of asking questions about value was raised? In all of this, I never heard the phrase political correctness. But it's quite clear to me that the kind of energy uh, uh, and attention being paid to these issues, that we were doing the kind of work that led to what would soon be called political correctness. And the fact that it was happening on a college campus made complete sense. College campuses, after all, are and should be dedicated to experimentation. Just think about it, new ideas are being tried out every single day. Undergrads are taking courses on topics they didn't know existed. Grad students are diving deeper into the unknown with every single day. And faculty are pursuing experiments in science and in the archives and performance spaces in pedagogy that take them in to the unknown as well. Universities are about experimenting and finding new voices and new ideas. But of course, they are also charged with preserving very old ideas and talking about what is valuable in those ideas. I mean, think about it. National archives, government repositories, and universities are the three entities, if you will, who are charged with preserving our national patrimony. But how do you process this kind of conflict? An institution that is about new ideas and preserving old ideas. Adding a layer of complexity to all of this is the fact that when I was in college, the demographic trend lines in California became clear. That within a generation, a little less than a generation in fact, the state would become majority minority. And for those people who found this a terrifying kind of idea, they were pushed over the edge when they realized that in a generation, the state's universities and ca uh, college campuses would become major majority minority. And since this minority did not have white skin, people were convinced that they were looking at the death knells of Western civilization and culture. Now, the anxieties informing this logic, or this logic is deeply flawed, because Western civilization has never been owned by one type of people or one hue. But since human beings, since human beings are deeply flawed, we need to take this anxiety seriously. We need to look at these debates about political correctness and see in them what it says about who we are today and what we will become. A few years after my slow epiphany at Stanford, I found myself at Yale University for graduate school. And after that, soon after that, on the faculty there. And I looked at, well, I looked at California always as a place of deep anxiety for its commitment to experimentation and disruptive thinking. It turns out that Yale was no stranger to the same kinds of anxieties when new ideas and new voices were being articulated. And these anxieties, I argue, are the kinds of things that are wrapped up in claims on or about political correctness. One way to start thinking about this is to talk about this idea, really a phenomenon at Yale called the Yale Way. Now, when I first heard this phrase uttered in a university committee, I actually almost laughed out loud. I was certain that the person who said the phrase, the Yale Way, it is a real phrase, was joking around, maybe being ironic. Now, since I was new to the university and definitely not tenured at that point, uh, it's a good thing I was able to bite my tongue and not laugh out loud. He was being very serious. The Yale way, as it turns out, is a call to tradition, a call to preserving those, thing that had, those things that had made Yale great over such a long period of time. 
After a while on the faculty, as I climbed the rungs of the ladder and then found myself in the administration, I came to appreciate that one of the things that made Yale great was its own reverence for its past, that it saw itself as a keeper of the flame when it comes to great traditions. But then there was something gnawing at me. And what was gnawing at me was the fact that this refusal, in a sense, to open oneself up to the latest new idea, to new ideas and new faces, meant that Yale was absolutely leaden-footed. It couldn't move when these new voices emerged. And a way to illuminate both aspects of the Yale way, the good and the bad of it, is to tell a story that shines light on how we think about education, change over time, and the kind of political battles of the culture wars that are made manifest in political correctness. About four years ago, when I was still at Yale, I was invited to give a guest lecture to a class called Directed Studies, known locally as DS. DS is a year-long intensive course, very much like the traditional great books, a year-long examination of those great texts in Western culture and civilization. I was invited to talk about the great African-American intellectual, W.E.B. Du Bois. And since I had just finished writing a new introduction to his classic text, The Souls of Black Folk, I was uh, ready to go and was happy to be there. At the end of my lecture, a young man raised his hand right away and wanted to know what I thought about a canon that was exclusive, that eliminated, it did not engage racial minorities and didn't include women. I found out at that moment that this lecture, the penultimate lecture of the year on the souls of black folk, was the very first time in DS's 40-year history that a book by a black author was put on the syllabus. I also found out that the next week's reading, which featured a woman author, was the first time that year that a woman author would be featured, the penultimate and last weeks of the course. So the student asked the question, what did I think of a canon that was racist and sexist? And my answer to him surprised him. He said, I supported the idea of the canon. In fact, every single book they read was something I felt that every Yale student should read. However, and there's a big however, I believe the canon should not be fixed in time. The importance for me of the canon is that a group of strangers coming from radically different experiences and background came together focusing on a single text and engaged in thoughtful, probably passionate, heated conversations about the messages of that text, its values and its resonances. And just as populations change over time, just as the look of Yale changed over time, so should a canon. Now, when people hear the idea that a canon should be opened up, that the reading list should change, it sets people's teeth on edge and they begin to think, look, there's an example of political correctness run amok. I just don't see it that way. I see it as an education. An education should be challenging and difficult and filled with vibrant new ideas, even at the same time that it's calling people to think in careful ways about very old ideas and to sort out where their particular set of values are articulated. That's an education. Now I want to move forward a little bit and turn my closing attention to an examination of how political correctness is articulated these days on debates about safe spaces on college campuses. And for many of you, you'll already know that talking about safe spaces means that I'm talking about, um, I'm, I'm talking about home. I'm bringing the lecture, this, this talk, to close by talking about Northwestern University. In August of 2016, the University of Chicago sent a letter to its first year students. And in that letter it said, the University of Chicago values free speech over anything else, it is sacred, and that, therefore, they do not disinvite speakers, no matter how controversial they may be, and they do not believe in safe spaces. Immediately, People all around the country, headlines talked about University of Chicago coming to the rescue of Western civilization, protecting all that is sacred, especially free speech during this very complicated era. Some of these same people 
looked back in their files and then criticized Northwestern University President Morty Shapiro, who seven months earlier in a Washington Post editorial had talked about the importance of safe spaces and why they're needed on college campuses. To those critics, Morty Shapiro was seen as somebody who's another embodiment of that, that, um, that college administrator who was coddling the next generation of students who simply couldn't handle the challenges uh, of a modern world. They read past the fact that in, in Shapiro's editorial, he actually talks about the classroom as being a place that should be unsafe, where disquieting ideas are worked out and wrestled over. But he said, shouldn't, isn't it reasonable then that there should be some places on campus that are safe? Because do we really have to be in that hyper-engaged way 24 hours a day? It's not healthy. Shouldn't there be a place for those people especially who get the messages consistently that they do not belong at Northwestern for any set of reasons? that they can find a place that they consider home. When people talk about safe spaces, it's important to understand they're not talking about, well, when I'm talking about safe spaces, it's important to understand that I'm not talking about a place that is a shelter to stay away from difficult ideas, to stay away from the modern world and all of its complexities. No, quite the opposite. When I think about so many students who are here at Northwestern and the challenges they had to surmount, the hurdles they had to cross in order to get here. It makes sense to me that a safe space might be warranted after all. These are students who, these are people who are accused of being snowflakes, who can't handle the heat, who for their entire lives have been surrounded by messages that say they don't matter as much. Their voice doesn't need to be heard. You don't have to make as much money as the next person. You really don't need access to the corporate suite, the executive suite in corporations. And you know, you would be hireable, but there's this lingering concern about fit. I think it's fair to say that these students already have a pretty good idea what the real world is saying and is waiting for them out there. One more thing to say about safe spaces. They aren't new. They just are now called safe spaces. The names they were used before, and these have been, they've been at universities for as long as universities have been around. The names that were used before were the chapel, the faculty club, the department meeting, and let's face it, the fraternity and sorority chapter. So given the fact that safe spaces aren't new, why the anger? Why the vitriol? Why are people so upset? Why is this a claim that advocating for safe spaces is about protecting a generation of people who simply can't handle the truth. I put it to you that these debates about safe spaces in our 21st century world are driven by the same kinds of anxieties that inform those debates about um, the culture wars in the late 80s and 90s. And they are driven by an anxiety about change. And in both cases, there was a concern that the face of the university was changing. I mean, the, the face embodied in the students was changing. And they're right, it is changing. With each new iteration of a new class of students at Northwestern, Northwestern is becoming more racially diverse, geographically diverse, and socioeconomically diverse. This is really good. And I'm really proud to be part of that commitment to a Northwestern that looks like the world. So we need to ask ourselves some really important questions. If we are coming to Northwestern for an education, are we coming here to be comfortable, to be safe in our worlds, our homogenous worlds, safe from the challenge? Of course not. Do we come here so we can only look back at Northwestern with perfect nostalgia about a great and easy time? Of course not. We've come to Northwestern because we know at some level we've come to a place where we're going to be challenged, where our ideas are going to be confronted with someone else's convictions, and we've got to find a way to work through that. That's really hard and that's really difficult, but we need to get to that place. We need, all of us need to participate in the hard work of looking at the code words we use in society and recognizing what's really going on behind the scenes. We need to look at the code words that we use and find a way to resist the temptation to use them. 
We need to open up our minds to the world that is around us. Now, I'm not saying we need to change our minds. We simply need to open our ears, open our minds, so that we can listen to what someone else has to say because it may happen we may learn something from them. Or it may happen that by listening to these other ideas, we are more convict convinced of our own idea and its correction, and the fact that it's correct in the first place. That's okay too. The fact is, in education, it's really difficult. It's really challenging. It's deeply uncomfortable. It's disquieting. Sometimes it's dangerous. And it's always unwieldy. And thank goodness for that. Thank you.